So hello everybody, you're very welcome back to Law Hero, my name is Jen and I make videos about the law and today we're continuing on with my Back to Basics a little series that is as much for me as it is for you. I am loving going back to basics, it makes me feel like I'm learning something and I hope uh, I'm passing it on to you. Uh, so today we're going to do a deep dive into the barrister profession. Um, because I have started to get into litigation a bit more now and because I have um, some interactions with counsel, I thought it was important to um, not only update myself but educate myself around the barrister's profession. Uh, I sell notes to King's Inn students but to be completely honest with you I am not really well versed on the profession and I have to say in researching this um, I learned a lot for example like I didn't know that you didn't have to be a member of the law library to practice as a barrister but in practice it's synonymous with like being a member of the law society I didn't know that for example um, but then the LSRA said you don't have to be but in practice everybody does so little things like that I didn't know um, and I basically had to look up so I'm going to share my knowledge with you today. Okay so we're going to do a little bit of a background so <laughs> confusingly from an Irish perspective um, being called to the bar does that mean you're going for a few drinks and I know that joke is really crap but some people still make it just like I did there. Okay, so it's generally known as the bar and individually um, they're called barristers or uh, counsel. Now, why is it called the King's Inns? Well, that was something I didn't really know about. So that is why it is important to take into account so the English influence on Irish law um, in this regard. So inns of court were established in London for the purpose of providing, amongst other things, um, for the education of those who wish to practice as advocates. So this is where the advocacy part comes in. Initially, uh, barristers were only advocates of court. And then a similar institution, the Honourable Society of the King's Inns, was established in Dublin and it remains the body that provides postgraduate legal training to those who want to practice the bar. Uh, unlike our profession, so unlike the solicitor's profession, uh, there is no um, law or regulation around, um, sorry I got just completely distracted by two people really in love. Unlike the solicitor's profession, yeah, so they don't have like the LSRA, sorry, they didn't have um, the Solicitors Acts, which we have had since 1954, but now the LSRA Act 2015, which I spoke about in the last video, now that is applicable um, to barristers. So this is the chicken nugget who tries to sabotage every one of my Law Hero videos. Isn't that right, Saki? And all he wants to do is be here and be robbed. So the King's Inn was operated by Royal Charter, but then when the King went away and the whole, um, later on it was revoked and it became a voluntary society. And basically um, it was controlled by a body called the Benchers of the Honourable Society of the King's Inn and they include members of the judiciary and senior bar. They took ultimate control over the education um, provided by the King's Inns and this led to the Barrister at Law degree, which is fascinating because before then it was just advocacy, but then they kind of formalised it into education. Interestingly, prior to 2002, the number of places available on the Barrister at Law course was limited to about 100. A minimum of 50 places was for uh, law graduates. 40% was for holders of the King's Inn Diploma in Legal Studies, which is a two-year diploma for which lectures are provided to the inn's own premises, and the remaining 10% were allocated by the Education Committee of the King's Inns. Because of the restrictions, uh, you had to gain a high second-class honours degree to get in. And in 2002, that's when the entrance exam came in. And that's when they had a mass entrance of a law degree, 
uh, or the diploma in legal studies and then you had to pass the core subjects which at the moment are uh, land law including the law of succession, uh, equity and trust, administrative law, company law, jurisprudence and the law of the EU. Um, they then removed administrative law and put in evidence instead. Um, they also removed equity and put in criminal and constitutional instead. And places of the barrister at law, of course, are allocated in order of merit. Since 2004, the barrister at law degree is vocational in nature. And in 2008, they made a part-time barrister at law, um, part-time barrister at law course. The course is practical in nature, focusing on important legal skills such as advocacy, alternative dispute resolution, consultation and drafting, in addition to practice and procedure. That, um, as well as completing your studies at the King's Inns, you also have to keep comments in the Hall of the Honourable Society on 12 days in the academic year during the Barrister at Law degree course. And that basically means that you have to dine, um, that you have to dine in the um the big hall there and i was in that big hall once and i wondered what that was all about um so it's a tradition that they would speak informally and uh, learn stuff from each other maybe solicitors should do that so then when you've done all your studies you are called to the bar in the supreme court in the presence of the chief justice and um, now, the LSRA is the one who maintains the role of practicing barristers at not the four courts. Now, this is the whole law library thing. So, call to the bar means you're admitted to practice as a barrister at law or junior counsel. So, you're called to the bar after doing your studies. Barristers are self employed and may not join together in chambers of barristers like in Northern Ireland and in the UK. Um, under the new LSRA, they will be able to make legal partnerships amongst themselves or with solicitors, but we haven't seen that come into um, practice yet. Pending this fundamental reform, most members are of the bar form what is called the Law Library. Uh, so the Law Library was actually a place in the four courts. And actually, if you've been in there and I've been in there, uh, that was the old law library. And the new law library is that distillery building where all the barristers are. Um, um, and there's, there's the Church Street building as well. And also some of the barristers are in the Courts of Criminal Justice uh, up by the Phoenix Park. Okay. So... It has been a long established requirement of the bar that barristers be members of the law library to practice. In the 1990 FTC report, this was regarded as restrictive and it was recommended to be removed, but they kept it in. The LSRA removed any requirement to be a member of the law library and therefore the statutory role of practicing barristers maintained by the LSRA contains both members of the law library and non-members uh, without distinction. That being said, from my research online, like it feels like if you're, and barristers, please comment, it feels like if you're not in the law library, you're basically screwed because like if I, as a member of the public, if I type in like find the barrister, um, the search function comes from the law library. I didn't, I know I didn't, I didn't really find any other one from the LSRA. Now maybe it's there and I didn't look far enough, but from what I can see, it's like, if you're a practicing barrister, you have a practicing cert. So you have to pay for that um, to, to maintain, you know, your, your, that you are practicing. You have your professional indemnity insurance and you have to be part of the law library. So like if I was a barrister, I'd be pretty miffed because you're, you're basically paying twice. Um, it, it's probably like the prestige, um, as in like, if you were to be out of the law library, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to learn from other barristers because that's basically where they are. That's what I feel like is after happening. Like it's, you're damned if you, you're damned if you're not in there. That, that's what, that's my impression of the whole thing. But again, please comment here if you're a barrister yourself, because that's what it feels like. 
So if a barrister becomes a member of the law library, she must ensure that she has an established barrister of at least seven years standing to agree to be their master for the new member of the law library. And, and the new member is referred to as the divin. This in effect mirrors the apprenticeship or traineeship for solicitors and the period of pupilage is 12 months, but usually there is a second year with a second master. During devilling, the master is expected to introduce the devil pupil to the general practice of the law library, legal research, court work and asset devil to assist with drafting pleadings. So a barrister traditionally requires to receive instructions from a solicitor um, and they were prohibited by the bar code of conduct from receiving instructions from other professionals uh, or the members of the public. This prohibition is described as direct access and that is essential element of the independence of the bar um, and to ensure they continue the strength uh, of as advocates. A, corroll a corollary of this convention was that once a barrister received instructions from a solicitor, um, they're obliged to accept the instruction unless they have no experience in it and that is called the cab rank rule. Oh, okay, so it actually does come from like taxis. So. Um, for cab drivers, no licensed hackney carriage driver can refuse to carry a passenger. That is brilliant. Let's see what it says on Wikipedia. Yeah, the cab rank rule is the obligation of barriers to accept any work in any field which they profess themselves competent to practice. So basically, you can't turn anyone away, only for limited exceptions. Wow, that's really cool. In the context of appearing in court, judges would also be reluctant to hear counsel unless a solicitor was physically present in court. Okay, so now we're going to look at the distinction between uh, junior and legal counsel. And um, I think I've only come across senior counsel, like I've only spoken to senior counsel like twice in my career. Um, and usually... Um, it's junior counsel you're dealing with um, as a solicitor. Hopefully, if you're not in the higher courts. Um, so, a distinction that exists in the bar is between junior and legal counsel. Um, and also, under the LSRA, solicitors are now entitled to become a senior counsel. At this commenced, we've had, we've had a, a fair few solicitors actually uh, become uh, senior counsel. So for barristers, the initial call to the bar is as junior counsel um, and that is referred to as the outer bar. The general rule is that a barrister will practice for a number of years as junior counsel before becoming a senior counsel. The move from junior to senior is called taking silk since the tradition of the black gown worn by senior counsel is silk rather than poplin of the junior counsel. Senior counsel are, reflectively, are collectively referred to as the inner bar and SC is used for a senior counsel, but you don't use JC for junior counsel, which also I find interesting because I always wondered like why they didn't have that, but it's just a convention of theirs. And these are all the little things you have to be wary of as a solicitor. Interestingly, in 2019, there were 352 senior counsel. Progression from junior to senior counsel is not a matter of automatic promotion on a number of years. Um, some people choose not to become senior counsel and remain juniors into their 70s and 80s. However, in general, um, most, barriers, most barristers take silk after about 15 years, which is like for solicitors after 15 years of practice, they can become a district court judge. The area was shrouded in some secrecy as to what exactly was the criteria to become a senior counsel. Uh, the competition authority in 2006 um, recommended that there be a transparent uh, criteria for awarding the title. And now since the LSRE Act 2015, there is a statutory process involved in applying uh, to become senior counsel. Uh, net, let's now talk about uh, advocacy. So the general perception of barristers is that of advocacy much more than that of solicitors. Um, and they are seen as uh, speakers. Um, you know, they're the ones, if you watch American uh, legal drama, they're the ones who um, are speaking in front of the jury, um, like in Boston Legal, for example. Um, they're the ones who get all the glory, let's just face it. 
uh, but actually in practice it's much more tedious than that and I've seen that myself from being involved in the preparation of litigation uh, all the way from circuit court to uh, high court court of appeal supreme court and um, they have a very tough job because they not only are advocates they need to know all of the evidence extremely well they need to have liaised with the solicitor they need to have prepared the witnesses they need to have looked at the case from every angle so it's quite a difficult job it's not just speaking nor is it not just writing pleadings or whatever sending um advices um, it's, it's a very rounded uh job now, one thing which I didn't consider, and you'll probably learn it if you went to the King's Inn, was the immunity from suit for advocates. So basically, um, you, as a barrister, um, they have immunity from what they say in uh, court. And I, I never knew that before, but I suppose it makes sense. From, our, from a solicitor's point of view, we can be sued uh, for professional negligence, um, how we handle a case, how we conduct ourselves, but I never really thought of um, negligence from a barrister's point of view. Um, however, in the UK House of Lords, uh, they decided in um, a case called Hall v Co and Simmons in 2000 that blanket immunity was no longer uh, a good idea. And subject to some restrictions, therefore, the law in the UK is that advocates can be sued in negligence where their advocacy fails to meet the standard of care normally expected in such circumstances. Therefore, it has fallen into line with the traditional professional negligence standard. While at the time of writing, and that is for Bernard McCutcheon, no definitive decision has been made in Ireland on the immunity, a number of judicial comments and recommendations for reform indicate that such a blanket immunity is unlikely to survive. So in Irish uh, courts, we have seen some examples of breaches of the Bar of Ireland Code of Conduct. And one was in the People DPP versus McDonough in the Supreme Court, and that was in uh, 2001. And there it was deemed that the public interest necessitated such a referral due to the possible breaches of the Code of Conduct where a barrister had accepted a criminal case during trial. In O'Connor v Power, the High Court furnished a copy of the judgment to the Chair of the Bar Council due to the Council's persistent flouting of the ordinary rules of courtesy and behaviour in the conduct of litigation were quite unacceptable. Now, the last thing we're going to look at is how barristers dress. Um, I remember when barristers had their wigs on. Certainly, you do see it the odd time, but I actually haven't seen it in the last four years. So we'll see. A long-standing distinction between the branches was the wig. Um, until 1996, barristers were required to wear a wig made of horse hair, as well as a black gown over dark clothes. The barrister shirt or blouse had to be a winged collar, and in place of a tie, the barrister wears a white band. These requirements were carried on from the rules like since the 1920s. Since the 1980s, the question of um, wearing the wig started to come into debate. In the 1990 FTC report, um, there wasn't a recommendation for reform because it was felt the wig created an element of intimidation for those not used to court, and I totally agree. <laughs> this is brilliant. The Bar Council said it had no firm view on the wigs. That's because the wig isn't a firm piece of hair. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but that it would not like to see it disappear completely. Because underneath they're bald. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just like, I just can't believe how much people cleave to tradition. It's just, oh, it's sickening. Like, you know, they were, they were just they forgot they forgot that they're there to serve the public not to protect their own identity it's just unbelievable i just find it unbelievable that these people the, like this is why we have such a mess anyway the ftc also referred to some judicial criticism of the wearing the wigs and noted had been prohibited in family proceedings since 1989 the continued wearing of wigs has an in inhibiting effect on solicitors representing their clients Facts. 
The FTC also considered that since judges also wore wigs, this may convey the impression that the two were in cahoots. Who would have thought? The FTC therefore considered it would be a sensible move to get rid of the damn wigs. Sorry, but like, I just can't believe that this was allowed to subsist. So then in the Courts and Courts Officers Bill 95, they put it down as a discretionary thing to barristers. They're like, you decide where you want to wear your wig or not, but they said it was no longer mandatory. Since 2011, judges were no longer required to wear wigs. And it was also uh, optional for them to wear robes. Now, in the 2015 LSRA Act, in addition to not being required to wear a wig, it is also not compulsory for a barrister to wear a robe. Amen. Okay, so that is our little trip down Barrister Lane. I found it very informative. I hope you did too. I love this kind of stuff. Uh, the next day we're doing Law Officers of the Irish State. And yeah, I hope you tune in. Please like this video if you're finding these informative. If you're a barrister, will you please explain the whole law library thing to us non-barristers? We don't get it. Well, I don't get it. Am I stupid? Maybe I am. But it seems like an unwritten rule that you have to be in the law library. That's what it seems like. Okay, everyone, I'll see you in the next one.